like lime, fertilizer, and what else? Uh, fencing. Well, fencing we're not paying for this year because of the, the money situation. Cut money. Yes. So you're still going to try to do some lime and fertilizer? Yes. yes. When's the deadline for sign up? Yes, I can't remember that. Done past <laughs> that is already passed. Yeah, but they do a summer. Yeah. You'll do a summer too. Yeah. So the best thing to do is to stay in touch with the health conservation district and listen over to Southern Fayette County. They're doing the same thing, folks. And so you need to call those two offices and kind of talk to them and say, hey, when's your deadline? What kind of programs are you offering? Most of them play off of a soil sample to try to get those in, get those results back. So you'll have those, and so uh, just check in with me. Health Conservation District, and Southern. The other thing is, they got equipment to read. If you need anything from from uh, <coughs> lime spreaders, to potato planters, to no-till drills, sprayers, and <coughs> got any fence drivers over there? No okay. fence drivers, Tom. Fence drivers too. So, yeah, so uh, what I have tonight is I'm going to pass around the signing sheet if y'all sign that up for me. If I have your address, don't, don't write all that down. I'll, if you've got a tough day that I need it. Uh, same thing if you got an email, put that on there. I'm trying to move towards more emails, getting the word out. And also, pesticide license. Does anyone have a pesticide license? Because you get some credits tonight for the talk. I think I've got a few folks that have a pesticide license, but if you got one, I got a special sheet for that. So, we have another guest speaker with us tonight. Um, so, this is uh, Alyssa. She's with the census, so don't throw anything at her. I know how y'all feel about those census. So I've had a few of you stop in my office and we work through them. She's not. This is with the. Uh, Census of Agriculture, and she's going to give us a few uh, tidbits of information. So they're really not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping that I would present before you had your utensils. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you for letting me join you this evening. I appreciate you making the time to listen to me and hear me out. And I appreciate Brian making uh, time for me to do a five-minute shameless plea for NAS and the Census of Agriculture. My name is Alyssa Kalmaitar, and I'm the new USDA statistician for the state of West Virginia. Um, how many of you have heard of NAS before? Okay, National Ag Statistics Service. So what we do is we are the statistical division for USDA. We count apples, cows, corn, and the number of workers on your farms, um, payments, plans, you know, anything that is agriculture and gets counted, we do the counting. So NAS provides a uniform, comprehensive, and impartial set of data for agriculture. We publish every county and state the nation using census data. So it's really important for you to fill out your census form so that we can get an accurate count for all of these, these uh, commodities in the state. We send out surveys and we collect the data from you directly. This helps FSA and NRCS get money for government programs so that we can bring more money into West Virginia for grants and uh, for government programs and other grants that West Virginia can utilize. We use the data for research, education, and to set and determine policies at government levels. So if you are interested in any data, um, we have them online, and I also have an annual bulletin that we put out. So how many of you have gotten this pretty green form? How many of you filled it out? Thank you, I appreciate it. How many of you threw it in the trash and thought it would make it go away? <laughs> well, I'm sad to say that is not going to make us go away. We're the government, we never go away. So, you'll be seeing another one of these in your mailbox soon. So this is your opportunity to be heard. This is your opportunity to make my job easier and complete it. We like to say that the census is giving you your voice. This is for 
through your future, and this is your opportunity to be heard. One thing to remember is that all data is published at an aggregate level, meaning we add everybody together and publish it so that no one individual producer can be identified. If you are a large portion of your county, we will contact you directly and ask for your permission to publish that county. We're not going to do it if you are more than a certain percentage. We have to have your permission. So if you think, I'm not going to give that data to them because then they'll know Jim down the road is going to know how many cows I have. That's not possible because we either add you to everybody else or if you're a large portion, we get your individual permission to publish that data. And I told you I was going to take out your time, so this is how you contact me if you have any other questions. I know that you all came here to listen to Mr. Dr. Midless speak, as did I. I actually grew up literally uh, looking up to Mr. Dr. Mr. Midla, Dr. Midla. Good Lord, it's been, he was Mr. when I knew him. Dr. Midla, um, he actually inspired me to go to vet school, and then I decided that I was done with schooling, and I would get a job bugging you all instead. So, when you get these census forms or any other NAS forms, think to yourself, Alyssa asked me very nicely to fill this out. So, fill it out, send it in. Your data will tell the story of West Virginia's agriculture. And, tell a friend to fill this out too. Anybody have any questions? our speaker today and so uh, this is actually Dr. Lowell Midla. Uh, Dr. Lowell Midla um, worked on a lot of his degree from, from Pennsylvania, Penn State. Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Oops, got it wrong already. <laughs> University of Pennsylvania where he received his veterinarian, uh, you know, his undergraduate with his veterinarian degree and then somehow in between he went back and worked on some more schooling at the Ohio State University after you received your veterinary degree, correct? That's correct, yes. That's very unusual. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, he's also, uh, I think, a pretty um, avid Hereford uh, supporter and reader, maybe, right? <laughs> that, well, well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, he's going to, when I sent this letter out, it, uh, does that help you? Yes. Dark, darkness always makes Herefords look better. I do. <laughs> So, else. <laughs> so, so we can talk about that a little bit. We'd be happy to visit about that. So uh, when I sent this letter out, it was called the dinner meeting on worms. So I hope you all enjoy the meeting tonight. Uh, so uh, Dr. Midla, the, the floor is, is yours. And uh, we appreciate you being here tonight to give us a little bit of education on some Wait, read some unconventional parasite control. Oh, um, you want me to? Uh, yeah, you know I'm pretty confident. I realize it's after dinner, but I've never lost anybody to sleep yet. <laughs> so we're gonna work pretty hard. Um, <coughs> yeah, go ahead and turn, turn the other one off. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. I guess I better put, actually put my presentation. <laughs> Man, they really look good. <laughs> So, so here's here's how I would talk about that. Um, I, if I thought Hereford cow were going to go the way of belted Galloways and Scottish Highlanders, and if any of you have belted Galloways or Scottish Highlanders, I apologize. Uh, I, I don't think they are. I think they're very useful cattle. We breed real cattle. We don't breed show cattle. And I think many people, I hope many of you would agree. But if you owned a, a cow-calf operation in West Virginia, a black baldy cow is just about as good a cow as there is. And you need Herefords to make black baldy. So I'm sticking with it. And we saw a lot of bulls. And so apparently a lot of people believe it too. So that's my spiel on Hereford cattle. Um, we're going to talk about worms tonight. Um, if I could get this to go, I'm going to make you frightened and depressed. That's my goal. 
is to scare you and make you feel bad. You ready? So but before we do that, we just need to learn a little bit about what we're actually talking about. So uh, this is from Lou Gaspar's work. And Lou Gaspar worked at USDA, same place as Ellis Cowboys. Um, but they did a survey, and this is from 100 operations, 24 United States states. 100% of those operations had cows shedding eggs. Um, and this is the percent infected. This one right here is really the one we, we care probably the most about. Ostentagia, ostentagia. That's the one that costs you money. And you really need to understand this to appreciate just about everything that I'm going to say. So, a cow picks up these larvae that are on the grass. In about 14 to 21 days, usually about 21 days, those larvae mature into adult worms in her gut. These worms in her gut are what rob her of nutrients and cause all the bads. Those adult worms produce a lot, thousands of eggs. Those eggs go onto the grass, turn into larvae, and, it, and the cycle keeps going like this. But one of the major points is, on your operation, we tend to think of the cattle having the worms. That's where the worms are. Almost all of them are here. This is where the worms really are. 90% or more are here on the grass. Well, we'll come back to that. So once they get onto the grass, the egg turns into a first or second stage larvae, and that's basically right on that manure pad, on or in that manure pad, right? It's when they turn into this third stage larvae that they start moving a little bit up the grass. Basically, they follow the moisture, and they need moisture. They have to have moisture. But every morning we have dew, almost every morning we have dew, and that's enough. That's enough moisture to keep those larvae alive. A couple of other little side notes, right? So the L, these are L1, L2, L3. The L4 stage, this is where, so the, the worm eggs can survive on the grass in the form of eggs. Turning from here to here is affected by environmental conditions. So if the environment isn't right, they'll stay as eggs on the grass. Um, the coldest winter does not kill off all the eggs. Those eggs will come back around next spring. But the other way those uh, eggs, or the, the adults come back next spring, and this is the case for Ostracasia, not necessarily some of the other worms, but um, is they basically hibernate. It's not called hibernation, but they basically burrow into the wall of the abomasum. We all remember cows have four stomachs, right? The abomasum is the fourth stomach, and that's where Ostracasia overwinters. It burrows down into the wall of the fourth stomach, and then it, it basically hibernates there. Again, it's not called hibernation, but think of it as hibernating like a bear in a cave. It lives in the wall of that fourth stomach. And then, and in, I don't know how this worm knows it's spring. Like, how do they know, right? How do they know it's spring? But they do, somehow. And they come out, um, and so you get a huge rise. And actually, in yearling cattle, that's called type uh, 1 ostracogiasis. When they are all, imagine, crawling out of the wall of the stomach, that's going to cause some pathology, right? The stomach gets pretty sick. That, that, that lining of the stomach wall gets pretty sick when that happens, and that can make, um, so springborn calves have worms in the fall, and then those worms live in their stomach all, all winter, and then about the time you're trying to get your heifers bred, they're crawling out, making the heifers sick. Does that make sense? The yearling heifers. Okay. So what do these parasites do? Why do we care? Why do we care about worms? Um, they do three big things, right? The main thing we think about is decreased nutrient absorption. So this is the, that, the wall of the, the gut, not the stomach, but this is the wall of the gut. 
Um, and, and so I, what I really need to do is put a normal one up here. I guess I'll have to add. I'm doing this tomorrow night in Princeton and the following night in Hinton. So that, that's all, this is the first, you guys are the first go round. So I, I'm learning how to make it better. Right? I'll have to put a normal one over here so that you can compare. Trust me, that's really sick. It's a uh, gut ball. Um, it's really sick. And it decreases absorption of nutrients from the diet. So, and this is increased nutrient requirements. Well, the, the animal has a set nutrient requirement, right? It doesn't really increase the animal's need for nutrients. But you have to put more, it has to eat more in order to get the same because it's not absorbing. That's what we really think of. But the other thing it really does is decrease appetite, decrease intake. So these, I don't know if you can tell, but you see this pasture is nice and green, so it has not been grazed very hard. This one, say, this one and this one. These two, this one and this one, and these are equal acreages. It doesn't look like this one is, but the same amount of animals on the pasture. <coughs> animals on this pasture were parasite free. Animals on, on these two pastures were parasite free. Animals on these two pastures were wormy. Mm. That's how much less they ate. Wow. Isn't that incredible? So, don't just trust me when I tell you. In fact, any speaker that comes up in front of you, don't just, don't just believe them, right? Question them. See if there's a, a, you know, evidence for what they say. That's pretty good evidence that parasites uh, decrease intake right there. And then finally, they affect the general immune system, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the number one effect, again, is to decrease intake. So moderate, and these are just moderate parasites, but 47 eggs per gram, so this is eggs per gram of poop, cow manure, 47 eggs per gram, or at slaughter, a total worm count of 11,000, which again is not that high, almost 8% intake decrease. 8%, that's huge. But even a very low nine eggs per gram is almost none, almost no worms, Decreased intake by, by 3%. Mm. Dramatic. So obvious effects on gain and effects on, if they're not eating, they're taking in less vitamin and mineral, right? It's proportional to how much you eat. And this right here is pretty proportional to how much I eat. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is decreasing the immune response. So I'll let you read. I'm not gonna, maybe I'll read a little bit of it. But just think of this. Um, let's take let's take lungworms for example. Lungworms actually get you know, get grazed, eggs get grazed up just like just like regular worms, uh, but then they uh, 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 are uh, they burrow out of the wall of the intestine and, and go into a blood vessel and find their way to the lung. And then they burrow around within the lung tissue. Now, when we have an infection, the job of the immune system, whatever it is, I mean, even a splinter. You get a splinter in your finger, and you leave it there, what happens? It gets pus, right? You get pus. Well, pus is, is basically neutrophils, which is a white blood cell. White, as in pus, right? Sorry, it's after dinner. I can say it now, right? But that's the immune system saying recognizing the splinter as foreign, right? If you think about the job of the immune system on the most basic level, the job of the immune system is to distinguish between self and not self, right? This is me, splinter is not me. So let's get rid of splinter. Let's toss it out, right? Now, let's come back to lungworms for a minute. You have a worm crawling around in your lung and there's no immune response to it, or very little. How can that, and worms aren't bacteria, or you know, viruses and bacteria are tiny, microscopic, can't even see them. Can't even see a virus on a microscope. You need a special electron microscope to see a, see a virus, right? Bacteria are barely big enough to see on a microscope. Worms, you can see, you can see. <laughs> they're big enough to see. And yet, the body doesn't have much of an immune response, it's kind of immunotolerant to them. So that's kind of the thing. So parasites are relatively large and exist in the tissues for a long period of time. How is that? 
So they have special ways to depress the immune system, to depress that immune response that the body has against the modulation of the host immune response is an active process. So they release factors which interact with host immune cells and, and decrease that immune response to them. Well, while they're doing that, they're decreasing the immune response to a bunch of other stuff. Like these two studies, where they decreased the immune response to a vaccine. These were, you know, they gave a, the same vaccine to animals that were parasitized and animals that were parasite free, and then they, they measured how good of an immune response they had to that specific vaccine. Decreased immune response to the vaccine in parasitized animals. So we're going to talk about. I'm, I'm leading like four slides away to talk to continue this point of immunosuppression. Um, but we're going to work our way through a study here first because it's good data. So we're going to let's let's hold 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 the hold the discussion right here. We're going to talk about the value of deworming for a minute, and then we're going to come back to, they also measured immune responses in, in this, indirectly in this study. So this was a really interesting study. So these were calves that were about 600 pounds, 744 steers, and so they were weaned steers, obviously, that they put, they, they ran them as stalkers for 118 days, and then they put them in the feedlot. And they treated them, either they either treated them with safeguard, or they didn't treat them, so this is the controls, and so this was approximately, what's half of that, it'd be 350 and 22, 372, roughly 372 steers here, 372 here, and then they broke these up into two groups, when they entered the feed, feed lot, they dewormed these, but left these, so these were wormy all the way through. These were dewormed at the beginning of grazing and at the beginning of the feedlot, and then we had control groups both ways. Okay, so not surprisingly, on pasture, we got 53 pounds if they were de This is just results from this pasture treatment uh, 1.3 versus 9.9 .9 pounds per day gain. <clears throat> Probably kilos, I would guess. Maybe pounds. Um, <clears throat> And then again, not surprisingly, so let's just look at uh, adjusted daily. So kind of surprisingly, the ones that got uh, safeguard on the pasture, but then didn't get dewormed in the feed yard, still gained more than the ones that didn't get both. That's pretty amazing, right? That's pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. So this pasture treatment carried through. They were less wormy going into the feed yard, so they were less wormy coming out. Now, let's think about it. Let's stop for a minute to review. Given that I started with the parasite life cycle and how animals pick up parasites, how many parasites are they picking up in the feed yard, theoretically? Not many. If, if, yeah, should, if, if they read the book, and listen to Lowell Midla, no, right? Now, I guess there could be some, right? Maybe a, he poops, a calf poops in the, into the feed bunk. Maybe that can happen, right? Um, but, but theoretically, none, right? So that, that, that's not, maybe not as surprising as we think that this would carry, if they came into the feed yard with less parasites, they would stay that way for the rest of the truck. Anyway, the point is, the best thing to do is deworm them at the beginning of both. Because then we get really good adjusted daily gain, really good feed to gain, and a lot more hot car carcass weight and a lot more weight. 1,300 pounds, over 1,300 versus less than 1,200. That's a 130 pound difference there, right? Um, 130 pounds pays a lot of bills, right? Plus five bucks to deworm them, 10 bucks to deworm them twice. 130 pounds pays for that pretty easy. But here's, okay, end for end parentheses, back to, we're talking about the immune system. Here's the interesting thing, though. This is stand, just treatments for BRD, so, so treatments for pneumonia. Very, very commonly, when animals go into the feed yard, they break with 
BRD, bovine respiratory disease, or pneumonia. Right? They get other things when they go to the feed yard, but commonly they break with pneumonia. These are the number of treatments. So the, the, these ones on the left are the never got deworm calves. Needed a lot more treatments than the ones that didn't get dewormed on the pasture but did get dewormed on feedlot entry. They needed fewer treatments. Interestingly though, the ones that were dewormed on the pasture and so were relatively, had relatively fewer parasites on the day they entered the feed yard required far fewer treatments. And the ones that got dewormed both required even fewer treatments. And that was statistically significant on 750 spears almost. Pretty amazing. So this is evidence that being parasitized compromises your ability, the immune system's ability to fight disease. Clear evidence. So, parasite infection modulates the immune response. Uh, very likely to adversely affect their response to vaccination. And these effects are probably due to direct effects on the immune system, but also just due to decreased intake. Right? If you're eating less, you're going to be less healthy. That cow is less healthy. And there aren't any cows in West Virginia that look like that, I do understand that. So, I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, how many of you own any sheep or goats? Yeah, so um, everyone else in the room can look at those people and see which way they're nodding their heads as I tell the story. Um, years ago, we used to deworm the ewes just before they lambed so that the lambs wouldn't be getting parasitized right when they were born. And then we would deworm the ewes in the spring. And then we'd deworm them a couple times in the summer. And oh, we probably ought to deworm them again in the fall so they don't go in the winter carrying a lot of worms. And then they get ready to land and we'll deworm them again. So we're deworming them and we're deworming them and we're deworming them and we're deworming them. And guess what? There's none of the dewormers work anymore in sheep. Now, there's basically three classes of dewormers. Um, the first class is the, what's called the macrocyclic lactones. So that's all the, it's, or a better word would be the avermectins, right? So Ivomec, Epronex, Cydectin, Dectomax, all of those are the avermectins. They work, they have a specific way that they kill worms. Another class is what we call the white workers. So it's white stuff that you put, put in their mouth. So that's albendazole, oxfendazole, and fenbendazole. Fenbendazole is our product, safeguard candy okay? So it's white liquid that you squirt in their mouth. We also have some feed forms as well. Um, there's a third class called, uh, I don't even know what the class is called, but levamazole is the one, uh, Example from there. Um, nobody used uh, levamazole. So levamazole. One of the things about levamazole is resistance develops to levamazole pretty quickly. Um, and so everybody knew that well, we don't use levamazole, so they just deworm them over and over and over. Ivermectin, 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 and then safeguard, 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 ivermectin, safeguard. And I don't care. You've probably been to these meetings before where they said. Something like, well, you, you gotta switch dewormers, or you gotta rotate dewormers, or you gotta you gotta de and I remember in vet school they taught me deworm them and then move them to a clean pasture. <laughs> How many of you have a like if you have cattle, do you have any pasture that hasn't had cattle on it in the last 20 years? No. Like where where is this magical clean pasture? Is there now all, I understand that maybe if we were in Illinois. Right there would be like corn and bean ground that we could plow this field one year and and then plant grass and then put stockers on it and grow corn and beans over here. I mean, but we're not in Illinois. I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm in Southwest corner PA, where uh, Alyssa and I grew, both grew up. We could we, we couldn't spit on West Virginia, but we could throw a stone and hit it. Um, in fact, as you go, so I'm in 
in Washington County, which is the next uh, county up. So I could, I could throw a stone and hit Green County. Green County's down in the corner next to West Virginia. And the hills just got a little bit steeper as you went from Washington County into Green County. And then it got a little bit steeper still when you went down into Morgantown. <laughs> but anyway, uh, shoot, now I lost my, my place. Uh, deworm, 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 deworm. Nobody uses Lamazole because everybody that knows it doesn't work. Come about 1995, when Ivomec doesn't work, and Safeguard Panicure and stuff we, see, we sell doesn't work. Nothing works. You know what people started to do again? Yes. Any sheep and goat people in the room? What'd you do? Yeah, we, we started using Levamazole again. And it's a silver bullet. It's magic. Levamazole, the silver bullet. Now what did all the sheep and goat people do then? They dewormed the whole flock with Levamazole. And then pretty soon, now there ain't no silver bullet, nothing works. Okay? What should have they done? Well, when we get to the end of the talk tonight, you'll know that they should have done it. Now, another story. My dad and all, this is another Novamazole story, actually. So I can still remember this. This was like 1971. I was about, or 72. I was about six years old. Six years old, and we were in Watson's barn down the road, bottom out, and there was some calves, and a vet had come out. A vet had come out and, and uh, said, this group of calves is wormy. you gotta, you got to work. Of course, he would have the vet would have said deworm, but my dad would have said, we got to worm them, right? Worm, when you worm cattle, that means gather up worms and give them to the animal. <laughs> um, so, vet said you need to deworm these calves, um, and he recommended we use tramazole oblets. How many people remember tramazole oblets? You know what tramazole oblets were? They were levamazole, and I can still remember my dad saying, I don't know why we're using this damn levamazole. Uh, it's not going to work. Everybody knows the worms are all resistant. And he was right. He was right. Um, and, but that's relevant to this same sheep story I told a moment ago. Even back in 1972, <laughs> that Levamazole didn't work. Finally, one more story. So I practiced for several years, started out in eastern Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, and then I opened up a clinic at home. Um, and I was her dad's and her vet. Um, and then uh, Ohio State offered me a job, and I went out there, but I was still practicing. I was going to a farm every day. They have an ambulatory practice, and all the best students have to come out and ride with us. That's what, I, that's what I did. And we had a lot of dairy herds, and we had some real beef herds. But the other thing we had was clubbies. And I don't know if anybody in this room raises clubbies, and there's nothing wrong with clubbies. Um, and by, by that I mean they, they had a, a cow herd, so they were a corn and bean farmer. They had 2,000 acres, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 acres of corn and beans. But, you know, what do you do? You get bored in the winter if you're a corn and bean farmer. So some of them went to Florida for the winter. Others, like, had a different hobby. They had a boat or something like that. But some of them had, like, 30 mama cows, clubby. Clubby mama cows to, to breed. I better turn mine off too. It'd be embarrassing if the speaker's phone went off. Um, uh, some of these guys would have these 30 mama cows and then they would uh, to, to produce club cats, right? Most of them had a child in 4-H so that, that their child got picked and then they tried to sell the rest as club calves and then the rest of them they sold as freezer beef. So that's what these guys did. And they were grain farmers, right? They weren't cow. They weren't cow guys. So they would call the vet for everything. We did like if they had a lame cow, we'd come out and pick up her foot and find out. Say, yeah, she has foot rot. Here's what you do, right? So they called the vet for everything. Every time they called the vet, though, they would get the whole herd of cows in. Every time they got the whole herd of cows in, this would be hanging there. <laughs> And every time they'd run, they'd, you know, like, let's say, they'd, they'd run them all through the chute and say the one we needed to work was, like, the 16th one, and they had 30. So the first 15 would go through and they'd put poor on dewormer on her back. The 16th one, I'd look at her and examine her and diagnose, and we'd come up with a treatment plan. And they'd also put poor on a on her back. And then they'd run the, 
last 13 through and put poor on. Every time the cows got brought up, they got, I have a big throw back. Now guess what? What do you think the result of that is? Resistance. Resistance. That is correct. So, here's our, finally I'm going to get to something that's useful for you to take home and think about. Um, remember that it, always, more than 90% of, of the parasites on your farm are on the pasture in the form of eggs. Most of these eggs survive the winter in the north or the summer in the south. You know, in, in, in Alabama, the grazing season is winter, right? The, the grass dries out and is too dry in the summer because it's so hot. So grazing season is in the Alabama is winter. Um, um, so, but with respect to the parasites, their winter, their summer is like our winter. Um, but every time, every time these guys, so these guys pour on this dewormer, then they let the cow out of the chute, and what does she do next? She goes and eats. What does she eat? Grass. Grass. And what is on that grass? Worms. Well, worm eggs. Worm larvae, right? Worm larvae. So she immediately just reinfects herself. What the heck was the point of putting that worm on her? I'm going to shake your hand. <laughs> That's true. But what did we also do? And besides throwing money away, what's way worse even than that? Did you say that? Rocky, so he said created resistance. And, and I'm going to correct you there just a little bit. Right? So, and this is just semantics, but I'm kind of a pure scientist, so we didn't create resistance, we selected for it. So some subpopulation of those parasites, so let me skip ahead a little bit. So his, that, here's the cow before she was ever dewormed. This, this is her, this is parasites in her gut. The black um, squares are susceptible paras parasites. Those are the ones that the poor on Ivermec kills, right? But already existing there, we don't create resistance. All we do is select for it. The ones that are resistant live. We kill all the black squares, but the blue triangles live. We select for resistance. So if we deworm again, we're selecting again. If we deworm again, we're selecting again. And this could be, this doesn't have to be two weeks later. This could be six months later. Right? Now that's not exactly true. Because when we deworm this cow, and she goes back out and eats eggs, remember 90% are on the grass in the form of eggs. Or, yeah, or larvae. Um, She's going to fill back up with some susceptible ones. But over time, what do we wind up with? What did the sheep and goat people wind up with on their farm by deworming over and over and over and over? We're just, every time you deworm, you select for resistance. So the more you deworm, the more you select. That's the point. Cool. So, so here's the point. You cannot and you will never eliminate all the parasites from your farm. We have to learn to live with them. We have to learn to control them and deal with them. And we need to make money while we're doing that. So here's, here's why, here's, so it's, we don't create resistance, we select for it. Right? A few to many adults will have innate resistance. Every time you deworm, you kill the rest, but those with resistance survive. Um, and that those resistant ones produce a lot of eggs. So they're putting a lot of eggs that carry that resistance with them in onto the pasture. So what did the sheep and goat people do? The sheep and goat people were kind of lucky because the main parasite in... I'll put my sheep and goat people in the room on, on the spot. Uh, see, we'll, we'll give them a little test. Uh, what is the main parasite that you care about most in sheep and goats? Barber pole. Barber pole work. This dude down here is pretty smart. That dude's smart. Uh, yeah, it's called the barber pole work. 
And it's actually so a little a little funny aside. It's called, anybody know why it's you're not allowed to talk. Anybody know why it's why it's called the barber pole worm? <coughs> so the, the gut. So so the, well, let me back up and tell you why it's cool. Um, so most of the all the worms for cattle um, just. Uh, cause changes in the gut wall and they basically rob the nutrients of the animal and they make it the gut so it doesn't absorb nutrients. The, this main parasite of sheep and goats also sucks blood. It sucks blood. It really sucks blood like, like a tick. I mean, it, for real. And so the gut in this worm is red from the red blood cells in its gut. The females, their uterus they're, they have a uterus just like human females, they have a uterus, and it's white, and that's where the babies, the eggs are coming out of. And the white uterus and the red uh, gut wrap around each other just like a barber pole. And so if you, they're, they're, about, they're about three quarters of an inch long, and you pick one up and you look at it, and you can see inside of it, and you see this little barber pole right down the middle of that worm. So you can recognize the barber pole worm. That's why it's called that. Just a little trivia in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, but, but here's the point, here's the point. So the sheep and goat, so this thing sucks blood, and it sucks so much blood that it can make that animal anemic. It can make it die from blood loss, so like not enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen around that land, right? And so what you can do is, and I'll put myself on stage up here, you can, you can pull, you pull the eye down like this, on a sheep and look at where the, the, the red mucosa is up next to the eyeball and if that's pale so that there's more than one thing can cause anemia in a sheep but there's it, if there's a 99 percent chance it's due to the barber pole worm sucking blood right they get copper toxicity and other things that can do that but if it's on a if it's in a sheep in west virginia it's the barber pole worm right um, so what sheep and goat people do is this thing called famacha scoring, and I can't even remember what that stands for. Um, but they go through and they look at all the adult ewes and they pull their eyelid down, and if they just deworm one or two ewes in the flock, <coughs> sure, they're selecting for resistance in the parasites that were in those one or two ewes, <coughs> but if they leave 38 undewormed, un not dewormed, the fraction of larvae on that pasture that are resistant, that we selected for, vanishingly small. We don't have to worry about it. Isn't that cool? Problem is we can't do that. We can't pull our eyelids down and check. So, what I suggest you do is to stop thinking of the cattle that, as the thing that has the worms. Start thinking of the farm microcosm. Your farm is the thing with the worms. That's what has the worms. Your farm, the pasture. The pasture plus the cattle, everything on your farm, but that's what's infected. This is not what's infected. This is. Or this and this. It's the whole universe of your farm is the thing that's infected. And what that will do is cause you to think more holistically about decreasing the fraction of parasites in your universe that is, or you can't decrease, you can't actively decrease. You can you can actively stop increasing the fraction of resistant worms on your farm. Does that make sense? So just a little bit of this guy Lethwick is like the father of modern veterinary par uh, parasitology. Um, the current situation in cattle and horses. Uh, indicates a failure to learn the lessons of resistance that we had in small ruminants. Despite this research in sheep and goat over several decades, the cattle and equine industries have remained oblivious to the issue of resistance. Um, a perception that this resistance would develop slowly is false. Clearly these preconceptions are incorrect. It must be considered a threat. So we talked about this, right? Every time you deworm, you leave the, the, the crazy blue triangles alive because they're resistant. And you select for that over time. So this is, this brings up this, the concept of refugia. Refugia 
is the uh, it is sort of all the par all the parasites on your farm, right? The 90% that are on the pasture in the form of eggs and larvae, plus the adults in the animal. If we leave, what we want to what we want to do is go back to this. Go back to most of them are susceptible. And we do that refugia, but instead of deworming all of them, so we have a herd of four times three, we have a herd of 12 cows here, right? If we deworm all 12 cows, then the only thing left is these resistant ones. If we pick half the herd and just to deworm these six, we might miss one in these other six, but what we're going to do is keep the, the susceptibles this is what's getting pooped out onto the pasture and eaten back up by the cows, our susceptible ones, by only deworming a fraction of the herd. And this is really a poor graphic, it was the only one I could find, but a poor graphic because our ratio here is, is still only four to three. We didn't really win there very much, but if you do that, if, if you multiply that out by more cows than a 12 cow herd, and you only, and we still won't, let's say we have 50 cows and we only deworm six, then most, you know, we have 44 cows spitting out resistant worms still. That's what refugia is. Refugia is those resistant, or sorry, susceptible, I apologize. Refugia is the, that population of susceptible worms that's on that pasture and in the animals. Does that make sense? We want to maintain our refugia. Um, how many cycles does it take to get resistance? One. Right here. One. One. Again, and it's because of it's because of it's because of this. You're not creating resistance. Right? You just select for it. You're killing it. Like, I don't know. There, there was something that came along and there was a big wind and it killed. Uh, everyone except for you have to be older than 40 and have white hair uh, then there'd be like five people left in this room right and well older than 50 maybe they might not reproduce very quickly but <laughs> let's say you have to be younger than younger than 25 and have blonde hair or brown hair there you go they'll reproduce quickly right um, you see my point though you just select for it Okay, so I'm going to suggest there's four pillars. Diagnostics, so let's do some tests. You know, a fecal test is, uh, uh, any, every vet in America can run a fecal. And we actually offer free ones. Call your market, we're, we'll come to that in a minute, but we offer free ones. We're going to treat, um, and I'll come to how we're going to treat. We're going to remember refugia, and we're going to do some management. Now, I'm not an agronomist, um, but they say, because these worm larvae, these worm larvae do not crawl up the great blade of grass very well. They tend to be lower than like six inches. I don't know what the official um, height is, but they tend to be on the bottom of the grass. So if you do true rotational grazing, where, and I'm talking like 40 cows in a two acre paddock, and you move them every, every day, right? They tend to only eat the top half of the grass. And that's what they're not basically not picking up any worms. Because the worm larvae don't really crawl very much. They get out of the manure pad, they get into some moisture, they stay in that moisture drop droplet if they can, because that moisture droplet is crude. Um, they tend to be at the bottom of the grass. So this is the management part of this. But again, I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not going to talk to you about what I'm not really an expert on. <coughs> but poor on amphimetics, and this is Reference are the least preferred option if the if the goal is to achieve long-term sustainability with these compounds, and this is partly why. And this is actually true for both poron and injectable, but it's even worse for the porons. So this is safeguard. This is fenbendazole, but it's tr also true for the other white dewormers. Um, this is day three, so we give them a dose. And they get a big dose, it gets up above this blue line, above the blue line is where you need to be to be killing parasites, right? It takes the, these guys, Dectamax and Ivomec and all the rest of these, 
up to day three to even get there. And they're above there for about two days. But then there's, it stays, all, it, it stays in a, a, a low, low concentration of that worm-killing product stays in their system for a long time. And when it's there, those parasites are being exposed to it in low doses, and that is where you get high selection pressure for resistant parasites. So, this data, these data, are from, we have something called, and I'll explain what this is in a moment, a database that has over 24,000, we've been doing this for like 20 years, we have strict rules on um, whether a given set of samples can actually enter the database. We actually probably have well over 100,000 or 200,000, maybe even a million samples have been set in, sent in. But you have to follow the rules in order to enter the database. And these are the rules, roughly. The rules are it has to be at least, I think, 15 samples and you take, you get 15 samples either before you deworm them or on the day of the deworming. And you don't have to like reach into the animal's butt, but it does have to be fresh. Like it has to be clearly a poop sample that was pooped out that day, right? If it's more than a day old, we don't want it. But if it was pooped out, you can clearly see, and we're all pretty good mineralogists in this room, I think. We can tell whether it's been pooped out that day, right? Um, so 15 samples that are less than 24 hours old, and then you deworm them, and then you wait 14 days. Not 12, not 19, not 32, 14 days. And 14 days later you come back, and it doesn't even have to be the same animals. It just needs to be from the same group of animals that was dewormed. Does that make sense? So we get 15 more samples, and we send those in, and what does that tell us? That tells us how well your dewormer actually worked. Right? Because we get samples, we deworm them, wait 14 days, and, and there, 14 is there for a reason. And I won't go into why, but there's a very good reason. Because it takes basically 14 days for the eggs they graze up the next day, right, to mature into adults. That usually takes more than 14 days. So if we waited, let's say, 30 days, those eggs that they graze the next day would um, have matured into adults and be producing eggs again, right? So that doesn't work. I told you I wasn't going to tell you, now I told you. It has to be 14 days. Um, so we're measuring, did the dewormer work? Here's our morons. And this is for, I mean, this started in like in the 80s, when these things were young and still effective. This is an average of all those. Nowadays, I'll bet you it's down here somewhere. This is our injectables. They do a little better. This is if you use a boron plus an inj injectable. And all these are macrocyclic macro lactones. So your, your avermectins, ivermectin, dictamax, all those guys. Now, I, I realized that I'm the Merck guy, I'm the safeguard guy, and all those, those green bars on the right look really good, right? Well, this, I didn't make this up. This is not BS. Safeguard, 98% efficacy. Now, let me ask you, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? You're going to be, you, you're, first of all, when I tell you the answer, you're all going to say, duh, that's right, you already told us the answer. It's not, I can tell you, it's not, because this is some magically effective good product. Merck does not have the magically effective good product. I need to remind me when we're done here. I need to put, do you guys remember my story about the clubby guys in Ohio? Every time the cows go through the chute, they get the pour on? That's why that is. We've created this ourselves. Who do we have to blame? Ourselves. What's that? I think the cartoon from like the 50s. I found the enemy and he is us. 
What is that from? Anybody remember? We have found the enemy and he is us. Yeah, it's because it's so convenient, so easy, and I hate, I, none of, nobody in this room, nobody in this room is, 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 is this is not a characteristic of anyone in this room. So, so other people, right? Those other people. People from Maryland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Pennsylvania. People from Pennsylvania, that's right. Human beings, human beings are lazy. Period. We just are. But Pennsylvania, not, not West Virginia. Pennsyl Pennsylvania people are lazy. We pour on, let's pour on, let's run. She just wants to pour on. Yeah, it's easy. I don't have to give a shot. It's easy. That's why this is, this is not magically good dewormer. Right. I'd like to say it is. I got a question. Yep. So, safe card comes in different forms. Yes, it does. Matter of fact, I put my hand in that. You'll be proud of that. Yeah, rock and roll, brother. I put that the block, right? Uh huh. Well, I just had a bowl and a heifer in there, and that's, I just bought the bowl when I'm yep. not sure. Yep. Okay. Which one is the one on the left? Which I see the one on the right is four yeah. and more injectable, right? So, yeah, safe card, safe card. So, uh, this is so sorry. I, thanks for bringing that up. The one on the left is, is any any safeguard product, whether it's you drench them or it's the blocks. Right, because that's used to pay sometimes too. Yeah. Um, this is an injectable uh, avermectin. So we're coming to this. This is an injectable avermectin plus safeguard. This is both together. Right, so we're using two different classes. We're using a benzimidazole class and an avermectin class. Two classes together. That's going to be the next slide, so just hold on to it for a minute. But the point is, this is the blocks, the paste, any safeguard. But even still, the percentage isn't just a few points off. Like, oh, I'm so, so, so since you ask all the, uh, the, all the good questions, <laughs> You and I are now going to take the advanced course, <laughs> all right? Everybody else, everybody else, you don't have to listen. He and I are going to take the advanced course. Ready? Let's go to take the advanced course here. The different, what was it, 98.7 versus 99.1? Yeah, you, yeah. And, 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 I mean, you're, you're kind of right. There ain't, there ain't that much difference, right? To but, but actually, if it was my hurt, it wouldn't be worth the money for me to do a yeah, full I, I hear you. Of a percent. I hear you, brother. <laughs> uh, but remember, safeguard isn't magic. Is That's true. Safeguard isn't magic. And over time, so so the point is, you, you instead of having, so let's say 99.1 is we just have one of these. Mm -hmm. Let's say 98.7 is we have three of them. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of the difference between, okay, um, wh when you open up the refrigerator for your cereal tomorrow, and you take the milk out, what percent milk does your family buy? 1%, 2%, or whole? 2%. 2%, okay. So this is the difference in perception here. Um, some people would look at that 1% milk versus 2% milk, and say, that damn 2% has twice as much fat in it. It's terrible. 2% is terrible, has twice as much as 1%. Another person might look at that and say, one is 99% fat free, the other one's 98% fat free, they're the same thing. Now, what I'm telling you is, that 0.5%, you're saying I don't want to pay for the Ivamec for that 0.5%, over time, that really, 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 really matters. And I'm going to show you. So this guy, Yaz Witsky, talked to the American Association of Bovine Practitioners. So 98 to 100, we're good. 90 to 98, he starts to work. Now I'll admit in my example, 98 versus 99, both of those are above those. You're right. Keep your britches on. Um, <laughs> But the point is, every little, the point I'm trying to make here is every little percent matters. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Every little percent matters. So it's clear that these macrocyclic lactones are not the same from this paper 
Um, and this is actually the same paper where I got the, the first, very first slide of, of 90% head cuperia and 85% head osteotagia. Um, so this is Australia, Australia, so this is Australia and New Zealand. Australia and New Zealand. You cannot buy a dewormer that has just one. So this is an avermectin, and we don't even have one, this one in the US. And a benzaminazole, this, so this is the white stuff, this is the ivermectin-like stuff, both in the same jug. That's all they sell there, is combination <laughs> dewormers. And it also, actually it's all three. They have bovanazole too, it's all three. All three in the same jug. Now you can argue, you can argue that, well shit if we, sorry, well shoot if we expose them to all three, <coughs> then all we're going to be left with is the worms that are resistant to all three, right? Turns out, the parasitology gurus tell me that it's still that, that, that that's not a good way to look at it. It's still better to use all three, but do it strategically. And they also throw in some magic minerals, right, to make this even you know powerful, good stuff, got some money in it. But the point is, nobody deworms with a single ingredient product. So here's what to write down. You ready? Deworm with both an avermectin and a benzaminazole when you must deworm. When you must deworm. Now, here's the one that's controversial. And not all of my colleagues, so, you know, everything in life is, is a normal distribution, right? Normal, everybody knows what a bell curve is, a normal distribution. I'll admit, and like here's, here's, where, here's where most people are, is in this middle. I'll admit, I'm way out here. I'm the wacko, tree hugger, crazy guy in the way I think about this. But mature cows, beef cows, are resistant, do not get what I would call clinical parasitism. Clinical parasitism is weight loss and diarrhea because of worms. If you, so we select, so we, every year we, we select which cows to keep and which cows to cull, right? That's what we do. So like which heifers to keep, and which heifers to keep, and which heifers to call, right? But we select on many things, birth weights, and birth weight EPDs, and weaning weights, and I don't know, apparently you guys seem to make fun of me with my herfords, you select on hair coat color, select on various attributes. I would argue that if you have a mature beef cow, I'm not, we're talking cows here, cows, mama cows, two years of age and older. If you have a mature beef cow that gets thin, actually, I'm in Western Dean, I'll say, thin, <laughs> and she gets thin, sorry, I'm not making fun, I said that was too, and she has diarrhea due to worms, she should just be shot, or not shot, take her to the sale bar. Call her. Mature beef cows should be resistant to clinical parasitism. Period. They just, they, they just are. They don't, they don't our farm at home. You saw all those herbivore cows. We stopped, we stopped deworming cows six years ago. The world did not come to an end. The world did not come to an end. Now it's true, you'll read in Drovers or Progressive Cattle or Beef Magazine that uh, You'll get a few pounds of weaning weight by deworming cows. That's true. It is also true. Um, when was the last time any of you saw a grub, cattle grub? Remember, you know what I mean? Warbles. Remember warbles that used, used to crawl out their back? When was the last time you saw a warble? It's been a while. It's been a while. You, why has it been a while, do you think? Where'd they all go? Have you been using Ivomec to deworm your cows? That's where they went. The yeah, Avomec kills them. And I will admit to you, so you can't get, how many of you remember Warbex? Warbex is what we used to use. That is what I used to do. But you don't want to know. Yeah, I don't want to know. You just want to use a little And it'll do. Yeah. Uh, now, Warbex is potent stuff. I've seen War Warbex put a cow down, too, actually. You get too much. Um, but they don't sell it anymore. The, in fact, the only thing you can buy nowadays that'll kill warbles is Ivanek. That's the only thing you can legally buy to kill warbles. 
So if you have warbles, then you have to, and actually we continue to do so from negative six to like negative 12 years ago, we did treat the cow herd once a year with, with Avonac just for the warbles. And I said, you know what? I haven't seen a warble in 20 years. We're quitting. And the world didn't come to an end. Now, again, you'll get a little bump in weaning weight because of a little bit of decrease. So here's the Merck line on this. Here's a, here, if a different Merck guy showed, remember I told you, here's the, the normal distribution of guys, and I'm way out here in the end. If there was a regular Merck guy here tonight, he would tell you to deworm the cows when you turn them out in the spring, and again 30 days later, and again 30 days later. And that's to decrease pasture contamination. Now in my mind, those guys think they own sheep and they think they're in 1985. That's what they think. They're wrong. I argue, I am willing, and this is a decision, that's why I'm sharing this with you, this is a decision for you to make on your own. That's one way to do it. So if you're only, and there's a lot of gray hair in this room, so if you don't think your kids are going to take over the farm, and you're only going to be in the cattle business for the next five to ten years, then by all means, do you want to hang out? Because after you die, that farm is going to grow up in, what's it going to grow up in first? Autumn olive. Autumb olive, and then? Both four rows, and then, and then wild cherry, and then pretty soon there'll be oaks, and there'll be deer in there, and the deer will get this stinking ostratagia that the cows left behind, but they don't care if it's resistant to Ivermech or not. Right? So if that's what's going to happen on your farm, by all means, deworm the heck out of the cow herd and, make, and get an extra 15 pounds out of your calves and put that money in your pocket. If you think there's a future for cows on your operation, Remember, think of your farm as the thing with the worms. The worms are on your farm. And preserve. <laughs> and what I would do is the reason I'm not going to, why do you think I'm not, well, you can read. I guess you can read, probably. Because I'm preserving my dewormer for my calves and yearlings. Because remember I told you, these do not get weight loss and diarrhea. Well, these do. These do. And I would de we we deworm for March born calves. I'd probably deworm them on, uh, on or about the middle of summer. And then I'd definitely deworm them at leaning. But it's just such a smaller dose, it's cheaper, right? Cheaper. And they're the ones that we need to keep growing. And then they, they get done at, at, uh, at weaning. And then we're going to deworm them again in the spring before we turn, turn them out. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. And that's why I'm not deworming these, because of refusia. These cows are pooping out refusia all the time that is susceptible. Susceptible. That's the whole point. Refusia is susceptible. Let's, let's all say that together on three. One, refusia is susceptible. One, two, three. Refusia is susceptible. That's the point. That's the point. And then, of course, if you have a feedlot, now, the one thing I didn't talk about is stalkers. I mean, anybody run stalkers? Do we run stalkers? So, so I would. If you're buying your stalkers out of Virginia, um, you know, or, or anywhere, Alabama, or even, God forbid, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, you know, they, they need to be deworked, right? They need to be deworked. Um, but they're going to be, but, but if you deworm stalkers and you run them every year in the same pasture, uh, what's going what's gonna to be on that pasture after a while? So after you deworm them on arrival and then you turn them out, what are they going to graze up? Oh, the larvae that are resistant. Right? Alright, i got a question. Yeah, I'm ready. Alright, I'm ready to <laughs> I use uh, Clarify. Clarify, yeah, yeah, good. I love it. Yep. I quit doing flat tags on my cows because it does very well. Right. And uh, why don't Mark come up with something that we can add to the mineral like clarify? And uh, that way, when they go to the poop, we kill them right there. And then yeah, you remember Rayvon from 900 years ago? Remember Rayvon? It was supposed to be the same thing, although it didn't actually work. Yeah. Um, yeah. We actually did have a, I don't know, I don't know if it was Merck or not, actually, because I've only been looking for six years. There was a bolus. Remember those boluses? I can't remember what they were called. Yeah. They were brown. Yeah. They were brown. The heck were those called? They, those, those were really good. They were expensive, but... Yeah. Um, so, 
Well, why doesn't it work? Because Clarify works. I mean, you already said you love it. Right, but I mean, for the one you did the same thing. Well, they did. Mary Ellen did. It's called Long Range. Mary Ellen did. It's called Long Range. And you know what that looks like? That looks like sugar. That looks like this. And then it gives, and you see all this in here, selection for parasites? Right. It gives them another dose right there, so we have a whole bunch more of this light blue selection for resistance to, uh, I think it's Epridex in there. Long range is the, how many of you have heard of long range? How many of you use long range? I did. I would encourage you to stop. I would encourage you to stop, because it is the best thing yeah, if you want to ever use a macro, any, so every time you use long range, you see all these up here? You're making it so none of them work. That's what you do. And nothing against BI. Rover and Ringo Hunt is a good company. They sell good products. If they had any God given sense, though, they'd take that product off the market. I really believe that. Because all it does is this. All right, let's, you probably want to go home tonight, right? I'll talk all night if you want me to. Um, Couple, couple. So, but if, if, if you have a feedlot or stalkers, a deworm with more than one class, um, when they, it, it, especially if, so when, when you wean calves, so let's say you wean calves in the fall. If you wean calves in the fall and you're putting them in the barn, right, you're not turning them out on a different pasture, uh, by all means, deworm the heck out. Right, because they're not getting more worms in the barn. So even if they po poop out resistant worms, it doesn't matter. Right, because it's not going on a pasture. But then, if you're if you're taking that poop, they all they all just poop the manure spread. Well, spread that all, throw only that only the spread that manure on the corn ground. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, how long this guy thinks too much. You think too much. <laughs> how long do those worms actually like live in that manure? Yeah, longer than you think. More than a season. They do need to keep having moisture. So, if you have a situation. So, so an opportunity to decrease, remember I keep telling you, think of your whole farm as the thing with the worms. If you had a situation where they had great, it's August, and you're going to have to feed hay because they're out of grass, and they've grazed the grass all the way down to the dirt, that's a day you could deworm your cows. Because any worms that they poop out there, it's so hot and dry in August, and there's no, and even if you get dew, there's no blades of grass for those larvae to hide on. Because the sun, the sun just bakes them. The sun bakes them dry. <coughs> now, here's the problem with that. The grass has to be shorter than a golf course putting green. If the grass is even fairway height, so like if the grass is three quarters of an inch long, it, it, that ain't gonna happen, that phenomenon ain't gonna happen. There's enough dew and enough moisture to keep them alive. So if possible, dose by weight. Now I realize you're probably not going to, my, my brother, now my brother does this not, be, not to do the right thing, he does this because he's a cheapo. And he measures out by the, by the ML, the dose of the d worker He's an idiot. Uh, <laughs> but, of course, that's what I'm recommending right here, right? Um, but, but here's what we'll probably do. So just dose for the heaviest day. Now I'm not recommending you do anything extra label, right? Follow the label. But, don't cheat them. I'm not telling you to double the dose or triple the dose, but just dose them for the heaviest animal in the group. Now, because a good way to, that leads to resistance is a sub-therapeutic dose. So slightly less than what they actually need. Right? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Don't forget, so when this ostracology, remember we said this L4 is in the wall of the Adelaide. I don't know if you can appreciate, but you see these little, looks like dots here, these speckly dots. They call this uh, uh, Moroccan leather. I've never seen Moroccan leather, but I've seen Adelaide. Has anybody seen Moroccan leather? Apparently it has bumps on it like that. So it's bumpy. Um, this is insisted fourth stage larvae. So what season would this be? In West Virginia, that this would happen? Winter. Winter. Very good. This is in the winter time. Because that's when they hibernate in the wall of the Amelis. You need to double the dose. Now this is this is sort of you, you need to get your vet, call your vet and say, vet, I'm gonna deworm with fenbinazole. What do I need to do? And they're gonna hopefully your vet's gonna be smart enough to read the label and say, ooh, you need to use double the dose. Um now, 
Very commonly, so let's let's play recognize the lesion. What is this right here? So this is a, actually this is a dairy cow, and this is her tail. So this is what? This is Coryoptes bovis or tailhead mange. These are warble. These are holes in the skin. This is the skin down here. Holes in the back from warbles or hypoderma bovis. This is lice, um, and these these are the four cattle la louse. Um, and don't ask me to name them. One's Linodapius, and one of, another one's Metaphinus, and one is the short-nosed blue louse. Probably one of these two. Anyway, very common. You can't imagine how many people I, I talk to, that, and I won't make you raise your hands, because if you do, I'll make fun of you. But I know that a lot of people in this room use Ivomec for lice. Ivomec is a crappy, crappy choice for lice. And I'm not, I mean, um, the people who make Ivermec, in fact, Merck developed it. Merck, Ivermec is a Merck drug, but we lost it through the whole, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies buying and selling each other. Ivermec is no longer a Merck thing. Merck has actually given out thousands of tons. Let me say that again. Hundreds of thousands of tons of Ivermec in Africa to prevent something called river blindness which is a parasite, it's a worm just like these that crawls into people's eyes and makes them blind. Um, we, give, we just give it away. Um, so Merck is a good company for, for that reason. Well, it's a good company for a lot of them. But, uh, but the point is, uh, there's both biting lice and sucking lice. Sucking lice get blood out of the animal and get a dose of Ivomet from that. Biting lice just nibble on the skin and don't get enough Ivomec to kill them. So first of all, all we're killing is the sucking lice, not the biting lice. Which, the sucking lice are probably more important. Okay, fine. This is probably a biting lice thing. Um, but also, you're paying like five bucks, five or six bucks a head for something that treats lice poorly when you could buy Ultra Boss or Ultra Saber or many, many, or Permectrin CDS, that's a BI product, or there's lots of products that kill lice way more effectively and cost a third the price. So they're more effective against lice and they cost a third the price. Now I'll admit though, that I was telling the, the guy, a good friend of mine, and I told him this story the last fall, and he decided to only use what I told him to use and didn't use out of it. And he wound up with a bunch of cattle with lice. That's another story. I don't think, I, I don't know where, what went wrong there, but don't use Ivomec for lice, that's the point. And because, if we use, what are we doing when we use Ivomec for lice? Why am I telling you this? It's not because I don't like the company that makes Ivomec. I like the company that makes Ivomec. But it's because when we use Ivomec, what do we do? Yeah, we're selecting for resistant internal parasites that cost us way more money than the lice do, right? That's the point. Here's your question. You remember your question before? Well, you know, I'm not sure they all get a dose, and I'm not sure about this fenbenazole in the feed business. It actually works. It really does. The main thing, like if you have, if you have a 12-foot feed bunk, and you have 35 cows, you're going to try to deworm? <coughs> that ain't going to work. <laughs> right? And, or if you have a 50-foot feed bunk, and you have 20 cows, but you call the cows and the cows come up, and when they're on their way up, you dump the feed out. That ain't gonna work either, because the first three cows are gonna get all the feed, and the last three cows aren't gonna get any. Right? So you have to do it right. But if you do it right, it works. Same thing if, if within the mineral, because the dose is cumulative. Now this does, you remember those curves of selecting for resistance? That helps a little bit with this. I'd, ra I'd rather squirt it in their mouths, then I know every cow gets the right dose, right? Um, but, but FDA wouldn't have approved this if this didn't actually work. It really does. I'd rather not do this, but if you really have to, then I guess it's okay. So we talked about this feeder business. Um, this guy right here, Walt Graham, is your West Virginia, almost all of West Virginia, field rep for Merck. Um, uh, if, 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 if you need to find his name, talk to this gentleman here in the back of the room. 
he can call me and I can get you in touch with the right guys. Tony Brubaker is the guy for some parts of Eastern West Virginia. He used to have all of West Virginia. He's a really good guy. Um, but we talked about this, a pre or windy worm, before deworming or windy worm, same way as working with later. This is free. Whether you are, now I'd encourage you to follow the rules and get enough samples and do it right, and then it enters our database. It enters our database. Um, but even if you don't do it right, it's still free. But do it right, okay, please? Um, this is free. And do it, do it, do it. All right, I'm almost done. You ready? Ooh. Holy smokes, have I been being recorded this whole time? <laughs> Did you keep up with me going back and forth? That's too much pan. <laughs> I do have a question though. Why are, you, why are you treating the animal rather than the pasture? Yeah, because there is no... So that's been... There's no magic pasture treatment. Other than grazing it down to golf course level and letting the sun shine on it. So diatomaceous earth doesn't help? No. <laughs> Well, why does it for design something for pasture? Yeah, that would be a good idea. What's the, what's the likelihood that, about the, e that the EPA is going to let us do all the There is. So, um, one of the... You can put your cows in the barn, treat them, put them in the barn, treat your pasture, get rid of the worms and the larvae. So then turn the cows back out. That would be good. Well, but let's let's think that through. The other thing that would be good would be something that had residual effect in the poop, right? Because then we wouldn't have to treat the pasture because every because that because all those L ones start out in the, in the manure, right? So there was a product called Raybon. And I don't know if anybody remembers Raybon. I think it was called Raybon. And that was like 1972. And that was the idea. It was supposed to kill both face flies, horn flies, and worms in the manure. It was a, it was a uh, insecticide in the manure. And it was supposed to kill the worm eggs. The, or not the eggs, but the larvae. Um, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, but that would be a good idea. But then there's the other problem, though, of... Things like, like dung beetles. Have you ever heard of dung beetles? The dung beetles roll the manure pads and spread them out. And um, that's why ivermectin actually kills dung beetles. Or not, I, a couple of those avermectins do. So that's another reason to buy our good safeguard instead of a macrocyclic black pill. Um, so, you know, I, I hear you. Good, good question. I don't know. I'm too late in my career to be coming up with new stuff. Uh, <laughs> so, I would encourage you to do some diagnostics. We do way too much, you know, when you go into the, to the doctor or the hospital, or, or even you take an animal to the vet, or actually, let me start again. You take a tractor to the, to the John Deere dealer. I guess nowadays they just hook the computer up to see what's wrong with it. Let's say it's 1975, and you took the 3020 to the John Deere dealer. <laughs> Um, um, and, and let's say it's a gas, it's not a diesel 3020. You took a gas 3020 to the John Deere dealer uh, and they couldn't figure out what's so the key is the diagnosis. As soon as we have the diagnosis as to why it's not running right, then fixing it is usually easy. But if you take it and they can't figure out why it's not running right, so then they say, well, I'll, I guess I'll just change the spark plugs and see if that helps. Or you just start guessing. Well. It's the same thing here. Find out. Any vet can run a fecal. Merck runs these figures for free. Find out what your parasite load looks like. So this is to monitor the parasite load in animals. This is to monitor whether the dewormer that you used actually dewormed them. It's back to his question of, what's the difference between 98 and 99? Well, there's not that much. You have a good point. But there's a hell of a difference between 50 and 99, right? And we're at 50, or even 80, we're failing. We're failing. Um, for treatment, use a dewormer from both classes. Use a use an avermectin and a benzaminosome. I recommend you use uh, Safeguard. That's what we sell. It's good stuff. Um, but and, and either of the other two work as well. Um, 
Another question you probably wonder about flukes. Anybody wonder about flukes? In case you did, you probably don't have to worry about flukes in West Virginia, so just forget it. Um, think of your farm as the thing that's infected. Refugia is a population of susceptible paras uh, parasites. Keeping that fraction of susceptibles as high as you can on your farm. And then finally, some of this management stuff, some true rotational grazing might help. So, this is Merck, this is what we sell, probably things you use like Thanamine, Safeguard, New Floor, Estermate, uh, Vista uh, vaccines, Vista, uh, IVR, BVD vaccines, Vision 7. Um, we sell, I have a whole nother talk. The next time you have me back, we'll talk about Pink Eye. How about that? Okay. That'll take a whole nother hour, and you probably want to go home and go to bed. Uh, any questions? Everybody, close your eyes. Okay, you can open them then. Yes, sir. Does Lyme help anybody? Does Lyme help anything? That's a good question. Probably not on a pasture situation. I mean, it might, like the day you put it on, those larvae that are crawling up that blade of grass, and it hits it, if it pokes the larvae in the eye, it might hurt it a little bit. But, um, probably not. Only insofar as, you know, one of the things when we, when we let's say, because my dad, we cleaned the barn, and we, we, we did it the Amish way with a fork and a shovel, we didn't know what a skin litter was. Um, and he would always line the barn, you know, the concrete barn. Uh, we have bank barns, you know, old bank barns, and we'd throw some lime down. Probably does as much, but it, so changing the pH helps, um, but, but just drying it out probably helped as much as anything. So, but on a pasture, eh, probably not. So it helps in the barn. Yeah, but we don't really have to worry about parasitism in the barn, picking up, or picking up new worm eggs. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, hi. Well, I had a lot of fun talking to you. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to tears. I didn't, I didn't catch anybody sleeping. Maybe somebody did, and I didn't see it. But I had a lot of fun. Look forward to come back and visit with you again. Let's get him around the car. But um, I'm passed on out. If you wouldn't care to fill out this really quick evaluation for you, there's some pencils coming and a sheet. Pass those pencils on down. If you'll fill that out real quick for me, and, and then if anyone else has a um, pesticide license, make sure we get you some credit tonight. We've got a couple things coming up, folks. Uh, here in March, keep an eye out. We're going to do a program in Fayette County uh, called Meet Your Forester. Um, and that's going to be at the Career Center there in Fayette County in the Forester Room. That's back in the back now. I just follow the logs. Uh, you'll see that come out. And I missed the date on it. I can't think of it. There's going to be five foresters talk on that. Um, so Carl Geyer will be one of them. Hey, the other thing that's really getting some interest here that people are interested in is this uh, forest carbon sequestration where people are um, looking at turning their trees uh, to some of these programs to, uh, they're looking at it for a carbon reason. They're buying kind of like the tree rights off of there for um, the carbon so that you can learn more information about that. Is do nothing and get and collect money. That's all. It's, it's free money. That's what it is. There's some consequences and we're going to talk about that though. Um, and that's March 23rd at 6 o'clock. So come out to the Career Center there in Oak Hill. March 23rd at 6 o'clock. Not a dinner meeting, but anyways, that's one thing that's coming up. If you wouldn't care, just throw your uh, trash away. I'll get another trash can. And last but not least, just leave your paper up front here on the where the food was. But last but not least, the final thing I want to say is thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. And I hope you walk away with at least one piece of information. Tell your neighbor about it. Be careful going home. Hey, let's let, let's thank this guy for uh, arranging this whole thing and caring enough about you and your success.